Welcome back, friends. I'm Annabelle, and I'm here to read. Every week, first we read a piece of classic literature together, and then we talk about it. If you would like to follow along, down in the video description box, there are links to a free ebook as well as source links and a link to the author's bio. This week we are reading A Lost Lover by Sarah Orne Jewett. For a great many years, it had been understood in Longfield that Miss Horatia Dane once had a lover, and that he had been lost at sea. Little by little, in one way and another, her acquaintances found out or made up the whole story, and Miss Dane stood in the position not of an unmarried woman, exactly, but rather of having spent most of her life in a long and lonely widowhood. She looked like a person with a history, strangers often said, as if we each did not have a history. And her own unbroken reserve about this romance of hers gave everybody the more respect for it. The Longfield people paid willing deference to Miss Dane. Her family had always been one that could be liked and respected, and she was the last that was left in the old home of which she was so fond. This was a high, square house with a row of pointed windows in its roof, a peaked porch in front, with some lilac bushes near it, and down by the road was a long, orderly procession of poplars, like a row of sentinels standing guard. She had lived here alone since her father's death twenty years before. She was a kind, just woman, whose pleasures were of a stately and sober sort, and she seemed not unhappy in her loneliness, although she sometimes said gravely that she was the last of her family, as if the fact had a great sadness for her. She had some middle-aged and elderly cousins who lived at a distance, and they came occasionally to see her, but there had been no young people staying in her house for many years, until this summer, when the daughter of her youngest cousin had written to ask if she might come to make a visit. She was a motherless girl of twenty, both older and younger than her years. Her father and brother, who were civil engineers, had taken some work upon the line of a railway in the far western country. Nellie had made many long journeys with them before and since she had left school, and she meant to follow them now, after spending a fortnight with the old cousin whom she had not seen since her childhood. Her father had laughed at this visit as a freak, and warned her of the dullness and primness of Longfield, but the result was that the girl found herself very happy in the comfortable home. She was still her own free, unfettered, lucky and sunshiny self, and the old house was so much pleasanter for the girlish face and life that Miss Horatia had at first timidly, and then most heartily, begged her to stay for the whole summer, or even the autumn, till her father was ready to come east. The name of Dane was very dear to Miss Horatia, and she grew fonder of her guest. When the village people saw her glance at the girl affectionately as they sat together in the family pew of a Sunday, or saw them walking together after tea, they said it was a good thing for Miss Horatia, how bright she looked, and no doubt she would leave all her money to Miss Nellie Dane if she played her cards well. But we will do Nellie justice and say she was not mercenary. She would have scorned such a thought. She had grown to have a great love for her cousin Horatia and really liked to please her. She idealized her, I have no doubt, and her repression, her grave courtesy and rare words of approval had a great fascination for a girl who had just been used to people who chattered and were upon most intimate terms with you directly and could forget you with equal ease. And Nellie liked having so admiring and easily pleased an audience as Miss Dane and her old servant Melissa. She liked to be queen of her company. She had so many gay, bright stories of what had happened to herself and her friends. Besides, she was clever with her needle, and had all those practical gifts which elderly women approve so heartily in girls. They liked her pretty clothes. She was sensible and economical, and busy. 
They praised her to each other and to the world, and even stubborn old Andrew, the manservant to whom Miss Horatia herself spoke with deference, would do anything she asked. Nellie would by no means choose so dull a life as this for the rest of her days, but she enjoyed it immensely, for the time being. She instinctively avoided all that would shock the grave dignity and old-school ideas of Miss Dane, and somehow she never had felt happier or better satisfied with life. Perhaps it was because she was her best and most ladylike self. It was not long before she knew the village people almost as well as Miss Dane did, and she became a great favorite, as a girl so easily can, who is good-natured and pretty, and well-versed in city fashions, who has that tact and cleverness that come to such a nature from going about the world and knowing many people. She had not been in Longfield many weeks before she heard something of Miss Dane's love story, for one of her new friends asked in a confidential moment, "'Does your cousin ever speak to you about the young man to whom she was engaged to be married?' And Nellie answered, "'No, with great wonder, and not without regret at her own ignorance.' After this, she kept eyes and ears open for whatever news of this lover's existence might be found. At last, it happened one morning that she had a good chance for a friendly talk with Melissa, for who should know the family affairs better than she? Miss Horatia had taken her second-best parasol with a deep fringe and had gone majestically down the street to do some household errands which she could trust to no one. Melissa was shelling peas at the shady kitchen doorstep, and Nellie came strolling round from the garden along the clean-swept flagstones and sat down to help her. Melissa moved along with a grim smile to make room for her. "'You needn't bother yourself,' said she. "'I've nothing else to do. You'll green your fingers all over.' But she was evidently pleased to have company. "'My fingers will wash,' said Nellie. "'And I've nothing else to do either.' Please push the basket this way a little, or I shall scatter the pods, and then you will scold. She went to work busily, while she tried to think of the best way to find out the story she wished to hear. There. I never told Miss Raisha to make some citron, and I settled yesterday to make some pound cake this forenoon after I got dinner along a piece. She's most out of mustard, too. She said about having mustard to eat with her beef, just as any old colonel was before her. I never saw any... Other folks eat mustard with their roast beef, but every family has their own tricks. I tied a thread round my left hand little finger purpose to remember that citron before she came down this morning. I hope I ain't losing my faculties. It was seldom that Melissa was so talkative as this at first. She was clearly in a talkative mood. Melissa, asked Nellie with great bravery after a minute or two of silence, who was it that my cousin Horatia was going to marry? It's odd that I shouldn't know, but I don't remember father's ever speaking of it, and I shouldn't think of asking her. Suppose it'll seem strange to you, said Melissa, beginning to shell the peas a great deal faster. But as many years as I have lived in this house with her, her mother, the old lady, fetched me up, I never knew Miss Horatia to say a word about him. But there, she knows I know, and we've got an understanding on many things we never talk over, as some folks would. I've heard about it and some other folks. She was visiting her great aunt in Salem when she met with him. His name was Carrick, and it was presumed they were going to be married when she came home from the voyage he was lost on. He had the promise of going out master of a new ship. They didn't keep company long. It was made up of a sudden, and folks here didn't get hold of the story till some time after. I've heard some that ought to know to say it was only talk, and they never was engaged to be married no more than I am. You say he was lost at sea? Nellie asked. A ship was never heard from. They suppose she was run down in the night off the South Seas somewhere. It was a good while before they gave up expecting news, but none ever come. I think she said everything by him, and took it very hard losing of him. But there, she'd never say a word. You're the freest-spoken Dane I ever saw, but you may take it from your mother's folks. I expect you gave her that whale's tooth with a ship drawn on it that's on the mantelpiece in her room. She may have a sight of other keepsakes for all I know, but it ain't likely. And here there was a pause, in which Nellie grew sorrowful as she thought of the long waiting for tidings of the missing ship 
and of her cousin's solitary life. It was very odd to think of prim Miss Horatia's being in love with a sailor. There was a young lieutenant in the navy whom Nellie herself liked dearly, and he had gone away on a long voyage. Perhaps she's been just as well off, said Melissa. She's dreadful set, your cousin Horatia is, and sailors is high-tempered men. I've heard it hinted that he was a fast fella, and if a woman's got a good home like this and able to do for herself, she'd better stay there. I ain't going to give up a certainty for an uncertainty, that's what I always tell him, added Melissa, with great decision, as if she were besieged by lovers. But Nellie smiled inwardly as she thought of the courage it would take to support anyone who wished to offer her companion his heart and hand. It would need desperate energy to scale the walls of that garrison. The green peas were all shelled presently, and Melissa said gravely she should have to be lazy now till it was time to put in the meat. She wasn't used to being helped unless there was extra work, and she calculated to have one piece of work join on to another. However, it was no account, and she was obliged for the company, and Nellie laughed merrily as she stood washing her hands in the shining old copper basin at the sink. The sun would not be around that side of the house for a long time yet, and the pink and blue morning glories were still in their full bloom and freshness. They went out over the window, twined on strings exactly the same distance apart. There was a box crowded full of green house leeks down by the side of the door, they were straying over the edge, and Melissa stooped stiffly down with an air of disapproval at their untidiness. They straggle all over everything, said she, and they're no kind of use. Only Mrs. Mother, she said everything by him. She fetched him from home with her when she was married. Her mother kept a box, and they came from England. The folks used to say they was good for bee stings. Then she went into the inner kitchen, and Nellie went slowly away along the flagstone to the garden from whence she had come. The garden gate opened with a tired creak and shut with a clack, and she noticed how smooth and shiny the wood was where the touch of so many hands had worn it. There was a great pleasure to this girl in finding herself among such old and well-worn things. She had been for a long time in cities or at the West, and among the old-fashioned and ancient possessions of Longfield, it seemed to her that everything had its story— and she liked the quietness and unchangeableness with which life seemed to go on from year to year. She had seen many a dainty or gorgeous garden, but never one that she had liked so well as this, with its herb bed and its broken rows of currant bushes, its tall stalks of white lilies and its wandering rose bushes and honeysuckles that had bloomed beside the straight paths for so many more summers than she herself had lived. She picked a little bouquet of late red roses and carried it into the house to put on the parlor table. The wide hall door was standing open, with its green outer blinds closed, and the old hall was dim and cool. Miss Horatia did not like the glare of sunlight, and she abhorred flies with her whole heart. Nellie could hardly see her way through the rooms, it had been so bright out of doors, but she brought the tall champagne glass of water from the dining room and put the two flowers in their place. Then she looked at the two silhouettes which stood on the mantel in carved ebony frames. They were portraits of an uncle of Miss Dane and his wife. Miss Dane had thought Nellie looked like this uncle the evening before. She could not see the likeness herself, but the pictures suggested something else and she turned suddenly and went hurrying up the stairs to Miss Horatia's own room, where she remembered to have seen a group of silhouettes fastened to the wall. There were seven or eight, and she looked at the young men among them most carefully, but they were all marked with the name of Dane. They were Miss Horatia's uncles and brothers, and our friend hung them on their little brass hooks again with a feeling of disappointment. Perhaps her cousin had a quaint miniature of her lover painted on ivory and shut it in a worn red Morocco case. She hoped she would get a sight of it some day. This story of the lost sailor had a wonderful charm for the girl. Miss Horatia had never been so interesting to her before. How she must have mourned for the lover and missed him and hoped there would be news from the ship. Nellie thought she would tell her own little love story some day, though there was not much to tell yet, in spite of there being so much to think about. 
She built a little castle in Spain as she sat in the front window seat of the upper hall and dreamed pleasant stories for herself until the sharp noise of the front gate latch waked her, and she looked out through the blind to see her cousin coming up the walk. Miss Horatia looked hot and tired, and her thoughts were not of any fashion of romance. "'It is going to be very warm,' said she. "'I have been worrying ever since I have been gone, since I forgot to ask Andrew to pick those white currants for the minister's wife. I promised she should have them early this morning. Would you go out to the kitchen and ask Melissa to step in for a moment, my dear?' Melissa was picking over red currants to make a pie, and rose from her chair with a little unwillingness. "'I guess they could wait till afternoon,' said she as she came back. "'Miss Horatia is in a fret because she forgot about sending some white currants to the ministers. I told her that Andrew had gone to have some horses shod and wouldn't be back till near noon. I don't see why part of the folks in this world should kill themselves trying to suit the rest. As long as I haven't got any citron for the cake, I suppose I might go out and pick them added Melissa, ungraciously. I'll get some set away for tea anyhow. Miss Dane had a letter to write after she had rested from her walk, and Nellie soon left her in the dark parlor and went back to the sunshiny garden to help Melissa, who seemed to be taking life with more than her usual disapproval. She was sheltered by an enormous gingham sunbonnet. I set out to free my mind to your cousin Horatia this morning, said she as Nellie crouched down at the opposite side of the bush where she was picking. But we can't agree on that point, and it's no use. I don't say nothing. You might as well ask the moon to face about and travel the other way as try to change Miss Horatia's mind. I ain't gonna argue it with her, it ain't my place. I know that as well as anybody. She'd run her feet off for the minister's folks any day, and though I do say he's a fair preacher, they haven't got a speck of consideration nor faculty, and they think the world was made for them, but I think likely they'll find out it wasn't. Most folks do. When he first was settled here, he had a fit of sickness, and he come to see me as I was getting over the worst of it. He did as best as he could. I always took it very kind of him, but he made a prayer, and he kept saying this aged handmaid. I should think a dozen times, aged handmaid, said Melissa, scornfully. I don't call myself aged yet, and that was more than ten years ago. I never made pretensions to being younger than I am, but you'd have thought I was a toppling old creature going on a hundred. Nellie laughed. Melissa looked cross and moved on to the next currant bush. So that's why you don't like the minister? But the question did not seem to please. I hope I should never be set against a preacher such as that. And Nellie hastened to change the subject, but there was to be a last word. I'd like to see a minister, that solid minister straight through, not one of them veneered folks. But old Parson Croden spoilt me for setting under any other preaching. I wonder, said Nellie, after a little, if Cousin Horatia has any picture of that Captain Carrick. He wasn't Captain, said Melissa. I never heard it was any more than they talked of giving him a ship next voyage. And you never saw him? He never came here to see her? Bless you, no. She met with him at Salem, where she was spending the winter, and he went right away to sea. I heard a good deal about it of late years than I ever did at the time. Suppose the Salem folks talked about it enough. All I know is there was other good matches that offered to her since and couldn't get her, and I suppose it was on account of her heart being buried in the deep with him. And this unexpected turn of sentiment spoken in Melissa's grum tone seemed so funny to her young companion that she bent very low to pick from a current twig close to the ground, and could not ask any more questions for some time. I have seen her sight of times when I knew she was thinking about him. Melissa went on presently, this time with a tenderness in her voice that touched Nellie's heart. She's been dreadful lonesome. She and the old colonel, her father, wasn't much company to each other, and she always kept everything to herself. The only time she ever said a word to me was one night six or seven years ago this Christmas. They got up a Christmas tree in the vestry, and she went, and I did too. I guess everybody in the whole church and parish that they could crawl turned out to go. The children, they made a dreadful racket. I'd have got my ears took off if I'd been so forth when I was little. I was looking round for Miss Horatia along at the last of the evening. Somebody said they'd seen her go home. I hurried, and I couldn't see any light in the house. I was afraid she was sick or something. She had come in and let me in, and I see she'd been a-crying. 
I says, have you heard any bad news? But she says no, and began to cry again, real pitiful. I never felt so lonesome in my life, said she, as I did down there. It's a dreadful thing to be left all alone in the world. I did feel for her, but I couldn't seem to say a word. I put some pine chips I had handy for the morning on the kitchen fire and made her up a cup of good hot tea, quick as I could, took it to her. I guess she felt better. She never went to bed till three o'clock that night. I couldn't shut my eyes till I hear her come upstairs. <laughs> there, I said everything by Miss Horatia. I hadn't got no folks either. I was left an orphan over to Deerfield, where Mrs. Mother's come from, and she took me out of the town farm to bring up. I remember when I come here, I was so small, I had a box to stand up on when I helped wash dishes. There's nothing I ain't had to make me comfortable, and I do just as I'm a mind to, and call in extra help every day of the week if I give the word. But I've had my lonesome times, and I guess Miss Horatia knew. Nellie was very much touched by this bit of a story. It was a new idea to her that Melissa should have so much affection and be so sympathetic. People will never get over being surprised that chestnut burrs are not as rough inside as they are outside, and the girl's heart warmed toward the old woman who had spoken with such unlooked-for sentiment and pathos. Melissa went to the house with her basket, and Nellie also went in, but only to put on another hat and see if it were straight a minute spent before the old mirror before she hurried down the long elm-shaded street to buy a pound of citron for the cake. She left it on the kitchen table when she came back, and nobody ever said anything about it. Only there were two delicious pound cakes, a heart and a round, on a little blue china plate beside Miss Nellie's plate at tea. After tea, Nellie and Miss Dane sat in the front doorway, the elder woman in a high-backed chair and the younger on the doorstep. The tree toads and crickets were tuning up heartily. The stars showed a little through the trees, and the elms looked heavy and black against the sky. The fragrance of the white lilies in the garden blew through the hall. Miss Horatia was tapping the ends of her fingers together. Probably she was not thinking of anything in particular. She had had a very peaceful day, with the exception of the currants, and they had, after all, gone to the parsonage some time before noon. Beside this, the minister had sent word that the delay made no distress, for his wife had unexpectedly gone to Downton to pass the day and night. Miss Horatia had received the business letter for which she had been looking for for several days, so there was nothing to regret deeply for that day, and there seemed to be nothing for one to dread on the morrow. "'Cousin Horatia?' asked Nellie. "'Are you sure you like having me here? Are you sure I don't trouble you?' "'Of course not,' said Miss Dane, without a bit of sentiment in her tone. "'I find it very pleasant having young company, though I am used to being alone, and I don't mind it as I suppose you would.' "'I should mind it very much,' said the girl, softly. "'You would get used to it, as I have,' said Miss Dane. "'Yes, dear, I like having you here better and better. I hate to think of you were going away.' And she smoothed Nellie's hair as if she thought she might have spoken coldly at first and wished to make up for it. This rare caress was not without its effect. I don't miss Father and Dick so very much, owned Nellie, frankly, because I have grown used to their coming and going. But sometimes I miss people. Cousin Horatia, did I ever say anything to you about George Forrest? I think I remember the name answered Miss Dane. He is in the Navy, and he has gone a long voyage, and I think everything of him. I missed him awfully, but it is almost time to get a letter. Does your father approve of him? asked Miss Dane with great propriety. You are very young yet, and you must not think of such a thing carelessly. I should be so much grieved if you threw away your happiness. Oh, we are not really engaged, said Nellie, who felt a little chilled. I suppose we are, too, only nobody knows it yet. Yes, father knows him as well as I do, and he is very fond of him. Of course, I should not keep it from father. 
He, but he guessed it himself. Only, it's such a long cruise, Cousin Horatia. Three years, I suppose, away off in China and Japan. I have no longer voyages than that, said Miss Dane, with a quiver in her voice. And she rose suddenly and walked away, this grave, reserved woman, who seemed so contented and so comfortable. But when she came back, she asked Nellie a great deal about her lover, and learned more of the girl's life than she ever had before. And they talked together in the pleasantest way about this unpleasant subject, which was so close to Nellie's heart, until Melissa brought the candles at ten o'clock, that being the hour of Miss Dane's bedtime. But that night, Miss Dane did not go to bed at ten. She sat by the window in her room, thinking. The moon rose late, and after a little while she blew out her candles, which were burning low. I suppose that the years which had come and gone since the young sailor went away on that last voyage of his had each added to her affection for him. She was a person who clung the more fondly to youth as she left it the farther behind. This is such a natural thing. The great sorrows of our youth sometimes become the amusements of our later years. We can only remember them with a smile. We find that our lives look fairer to us, and we forget what used to trouble us so much when we look back. Miss Dane certainly had come nearer to truly loving the sailor than she had anyone else, and the more she thought of it, the more it became the romance of her life. She no longer asked herself, as she had often done in middle life, whether if he had lived and come home, she would have loved and married him. She had minded less and less, year by year, knowing that her friends and neighbors thought her faithful to the love of her youth. Poor, gay, handsome Joe Carrick. How fond he had been of her, and how he had looked at her that day he sailed away out of Salem Harbor on the Brig Chevalier. If she had only known that she should never see him again. Poor fellow. But, as usual, her thoughts changed their current a little at the end of her reverie. Perhaps, after all, loneliness was not so hard to bear as other sorrows. She had had a pleasant life. God had been very good to her, and had spared her many trials and granted her many blessings. I am an old woman now, she said to herself. Things are better as they are. I can get on by myself better than most women can, and I never should have liked to be interfered with. Then she shut out the moonlight and lighted her candles again with an almost guilty feeling. What should I say if Nellie sat up till nearly midnight looking at the moon, she thought. It is very silly, but this is such a beautiful night. I should like to have her see the moon shining through the tops of the trees. But Nellie was sleeping the sleep of the just and sensible in her own room. The next morning at breakfast, Nellie was a little conscious of there having been uncommon confidences the night before. But Miss Dane was her usual calm and somewhat formal self, and proposed their making a few calls after dinner if the weather were not too hot. Nellie at once wondered what she had better wear. There was a certain black grenadine which Miss Horatia had noticed with approval, and she remembered that the lower ruffle needed hemming, and made up her mind that she would devote most of the time before dinner to that and to some other repairs. So, after breakfast was over, she brought the dress herself with her workbox and settled herself in the dining room. Miss Dane usually sat there in the morning. It was a pleasant room, and she could keep an unsuspected watch over the kitchen and Melissa who did not need watching in the least. I dare say it was for the sake of being within the sound of a voice. Miss Dane marched in and out of that morning. She went upstairs and came down again, and was mysteriously busy for a while in the parlor. Nellie was sewing steadily by a window, where one of the blinds was a little way open, and tethered in its place by a string. She hummed a tune to herself, over and over, what will you do, love, when I am going, with white sails flowing, the seas beyond? And old Melissa, going to and fro at her work in the kitchen, grumbled at bits of an ancient psalm tune at intervals. 
There seemed to be some connection between these fragments and her mind. It was like a ledge of rock in a pasture that sometimes runs under the ground and then crops out again. Perhaps it was the tune of Wyndham. Nally found that there was a good deal to be done to the grenadine dress when she looked at it over critically, and became very diligent. It was quiet in and about the house for a long time, until suddenly she heard the sound of heavy footsteps coming in from the road. The side door was in a little entry between the room where Nellie sat and the kitchen, and the newcomer knocked loudly. A tramp, said Nellie to herself, while Melissa came to open the door, wiping her hands hurriedly on her apron. I wonder if you couldn't give me something to eat, said the man. I suppose I could, answered Melissa. Will you step in? Beggars were very few in Longfield, and Miss Dane never wished anybody to go away hungry from her house. It was off the grand highway of tramps, but they were by no means unknown. Melissa searched among her stores, and Nellie heard her putting one plate after another on the kitchen table, and thought that the breakfast promised to be a good one, if it were late. "'Don't put yourself out,' said the man, as he moved his chair nearer. "'I lodged in an old barn three or four miles above here last night,' There didn't seem to be very good board there. Going far, inquired Melissa concisely. Boston, said the man. I'm a little too old to travel afoot. Now if I could go by water, it would seem nearer. I'm more used to the water. This is a royal good piece of beef. I suppose you couldn't put your hand on a mug of cider. This was said humbly, but the tone failed to touch Melissa's heart. No, I couldn't she said decisively, so that was an end to that, and the conversation flagged for a time. Presently, Melissa came to speak to Miss Dane, who had just come downstairs. "'Could you stay in the kitchen a few minutes?' she whispered. "'There's an old creature there that looks foreign. I came to the door for something to eat, and I gave it to him, but he's miserable-looking. I don't like to leave him alone. I'm just in the midst of dressing the chickens. He'll be through pretty quick, according to the way he's eating now.' Miss Dane followed her without a word, and the man half rose and said, "'Good morning, madam,' with unusual courtesy. And when Melissa was out of hearing, he spoke again. "'I suppose you haven't any cider?' To which his hostess answered, "'I couldn't give you any this morning,' in a tone that left no room for argument. He looked as if he had had a great deal too much to drink already." "'How far do you call it from here to Boston?' he asked, and was told that it was eighty miles. "'I'm a slow traveller,' said he. "'Sailors don't take much to walking.' Miss Dane asked him if he had been a sailor. "'Nothing else,' replied the man, who seemed much inclined to talk. He had been eating like a hungry dog, as if he were half-starved, a slouching, red-faced, untidy-looking old man, with some traces of the former good looks still to be discovered in his face.' Nothing else. I ran away to sea when I was a boy, and I followed it until I got so old they wouldn't ship me even for cook. There was something in his feeling for once so comfortable. Perhaps it was being with a lady like Miss Dane, who pitied him, that lifted his thoughts a little from their usual low level. It's drink that's been the ruin of me, said he. I ought to have been somebody. I was nobody's fool when I was young. I got to be mate of a first-rate ship. There was some talk of my being captain before long. She was lost that voyage, and three of us were all that was saved. We got picked up by a Chinese junk. She had the plague board of her, and my mates died, and I was down myself. It was a hell of a place to be in. When I got ashore, I shipped off in an old bark that pretended to be coming round the Cape, and she turned out to be a pirate. I just went to the dogs, and I've gone from bad to worse ever since. It's never too late to mend, said Melissa, who came into the chicken just then for a string to tie the chickens. Lord help us, yes it is, said the sailor. It's easy for you to say that, I'm too old. I ain't been master of this craft for a good while. And he laughed at this melancholy joke. Don't say that, said Miss Dane. Well now, what could an old rack like me do to earn a living? And who'd want me if I could? You wouldn't. I don't know when I've been treated so decent as this before. I'm all broke down. But his tone was no longer sincere. He had fallen back on his profession of beggar. 
Couldn't you get into some asylum? Or there's the sailor's snug harbor, isn't that for men like you? Seems such a pity for a man of your years to be homeless and a wanderer. Haven't you got any friends at all? And here, suddenly, Miss Dane's face altered and she grew very white. Something startled her. She looked as one might who saw a fearful ghost. No, said the man. But my folks used to be some of the best in Salem. I haven't shown my head up there this good while. I was an orphan. My grandmother brought me up. You see, I didn't come back to the States for thirty or forty years. Along at the first of it, I used to see men in port that I used to know. But I always dodged them, and I was way off in outlandish places. I've got an awful sight to answer for. I used to have a good wife when I was in Australia. I don't know where I haven't been, first and last. I was always a gay fellow. Spent as much as a couple fortunes, and here I am a beggin'. Devil take it. Nellie was still sewing in the dining room, but soon after Miss Dane had gone out to the kitchen, one of the doors between had slowly closed itself with a plaintive whine. The round stone which Melissa used to keep it open had been pushed away. Nellie was a little annoyed. She liked to hear what was going on, but she was just then holding her work with great care in a place that was hard to sew, so she did not move. She heard the murmur of voices and thought after a while that the old vagabond ought to go away by this time. What could be making her cousin Horatia talk so long with him? It was not like her at all. He would beg for money, of course, and she hoped Miss Horatia would not give him a single cent. It was some time before the kitchen door opened and the man came out with clumsy, stumbling steps. I'm much obliged to you, he said, and... I don't know, but it is the last time I'll get treated as if I was a gentleman. Is there anything I could do for you round the place? He asked, hesitatingly, and as if he hoped that his offer would not be accepted. No, answered Miss Dane. No, thank you. Goodbye. And he went away. The old beggar had been lifted a little above his low life. He fell back again directly before he was out of the gate. I'm blessed if she didn't give me a ten-dollar bill, said he. She must have thought it was one. I'll get out of call as quick as I can. I hope she won't find it out and send anybody after me. Visions of unlimited drinks and other things in which it was possible to find pleasure flitted through his stupid mind. How the old lady stared at me once, he thought. Wonder if she was anybody I used to know. Downton? I don't know as I ever heard of the place and he scuffed along the dusty road, and that night he was very drunk, and the next day he went wandering on, God only knows where. But Nellie and Melissa both heard a strange noise in the kitchen as if someone had fallen, and they found that Miss Horatia had fainted dead away. It was partly the heat, she said, when she saw their anxious faces as she came to herself. She had had a little headache all the morning. It was very hot and close in the kitchen, and the faintness had come upon her suddenly. They helped her to walk into the cool parlor presently, and Melissa brought her a glass of wine, and Nellie sat beside her on a footstool as she lay on the sofa and fanned her. Once she held her cheek against Miss Horatia's hand for a minute, and she will never know as long as she lives what a comfort she was that day. Everyone but Miss Dane forgot the old sailor tramp in this excitement that followed his visit. Did you guess already who he was? But the certainty could not come to you with the chill and horror it did to Miss Dane. There had been something familiar in his look and voice from the first, and then she had suddenly known him, her lost lover. It was an awful change that the years had made in him. He had truly called himself a wreck. He was like some dreary wreck in its decay and utter ruin, its miserable ugliness and worthlessness falling to pieces in the slow tides of a lifeless southern sea. And he had once been her lover, Miss Dane thought bitterly many times in the days that followed. Not that there was ever anything asked or promised between them, but they had liked each other dearly and had parted with deep sorrow. She had thought of him all these years so 
tenderly. She had believed always that his love had been even greater than her own, and never once had doubted that the missing brig Chevalier had carried with it down into the sea a heart that was true to her. Little by little, this all grew familiar, and she accustomed herself to the knowledge of her new secret. She shuddered at the thought of the misery of a life with him, and she thanked God for sparing her such shame and despair. The distance between them seemed immense. She had always been a person of so much consequence among her friends, and so dutiful and irreproachable a woman. She had not begun to understand what dishonor is in the world. Her life had been shut in by safe and orderly surroundings. It was a strange chance that had brought this wanderer to her, do to her door. She remembered his wretched untidiness. She had not liked even to stand near him. She had never imagined him grown old. He had always been young to her. It was a great mercy he had not known her. It would have been a most miserable position for them both, and yet she thought, with sad surprise, that she had not known she had changed so entirely. She thought of the different ways their roads in life had gone. She pitied him. She cried about him more than once, and she wished that she could know he was dead. He might have been such a brave good man with his strong will and resolute courage. God forgive him for the wickedness which his strength had been made to serve. God forgive him, said Miss Horatia to herself sadly, over and over again. She wondered if she ought to have let him go away, and so have lost sight of him. But she could not do anything else. She suffered terribly on his account. She had a pity, such as God's pity must be, for even his willful sins. So, her romance was all over with, yet the townspeople still whispered it to strangers, and even Melissa and Nellie never knew how she had really lost her lover in so strange and sad a way in her latest years. Nobody noticed much change, but Melissa saw that the whale's tooth disappeared from its place in Miss Horatia's room, and her old friends said to each other she began to show her age a great deal. She seemed really like an old woman now. She was not the woman she had been a year ago. This is all of the story. But we so often wish when a story comes to an end that we knew what became of the people afterward. Shall we believe that Miss Horatia clings more and more fondly to her cousin Nellie, and that Nellie will stay with her a great deal before she marries, and sometimes afterward when the lieutenant goes away to sea? Shall we say that Miss Dane seems as well satisfied and comfortable as ever, though she acknowledges she is not so young as she used to be, and secretly misses something out of her life? It is the contentment of winter rather than that of summer, the flowers are out of bloom for her now, and under the snow. And Melissa, will not she always be the same, with a quaintness and freshness and toughness like a cedar tree, to the end of her days? Let us hope they will live on together and be untroubled this long time yet, the two good women. And let us wish Nellie much pleasure, and a sweet soberness and fearlessness as she grows older, and finds life a harder thing to understand and a graver thing to know. The End A Lost Lover is one of those titles that I really like because you're not sure if it's referring to the dude or Horatia. And A Lost Lover, the title of which I love, was initially published in Atlantic Monthly in 1878 and then later it was published in Sarah Orne Jewett's short story collection, Old Friends and New in 1879. And that mostly featured a bunch of stories that had previously appeared in Atlantic Monthly. Every time we talk about Sarah Orne Jewett, we have to talk about the American literary regionalism movement because she is like, if you Google American literary regionalism movement, it's like Mark Twain, Mississippi River, 
Lily Cather, you know, pioneers, westward people, farmers in the in the Midwest, and then you have Sarah Orndewitt in Maine, very specifically Maine. Even though I can't do really a Maine accent, like Melissa's accent is of, I I cannot do. It's kind of it's like Boston, but not quite, and it's. I've been I've been working on it. It's not there yet. But American regionalism was this movement um, right around and immediately after the Civil War when uh, they were doing this kind of unifying hand gesture to unify the North and the South again after the Civil War. And a great way to do that was by telling all of these um, kind I don't want to call it like a small story, but it's just kind of these little like flashes of life for these, like just the way that they live in these different places. And the people who live in Maine have their own little Maine style adventures, even if Sarah Orne Jewett didn't say like, oh, and then Horatia Dane went to Bar Harbor and ate a lobster roll. You can still tell that this is supposed to be set in Maine. I keep wanting to read Sarah Orne Jewett, and two things keep stopping me. The biggest one is that main accent. I just, it's really bad. I don't even want to like pretend to, it, it's, it's just really bad, you guys. And the other thing is because these stories are so, I don't want to say that they're small, but they're like such a microcosm, it's very difficult to just pick out one. Like I kind of want to read all of them. But again, that's kind of a problem because I can't do a main accent. But I wound up choosing this story because in some ways it sort of mirrors Sarah Orne Jewett's own story. See, Sarah Orne Jewett was kind of like Horatia Dane, not necessarily in the like, ah, oh, she had this lover that was lost at same blah, blah, blah. But um, the whole sentiment of uh, both Horatia and Melissa saying, you know, I have lived by myself this long. Why do I, I'm self-sufficient. I'm fine. I don't, I don't need a man. That's kind of how Sarah Orne Jewett's life sort of played out. And eventually she, um, she wound up living with Annie Fields, who was a friend of hers, who was the editor of Atlantic Monthly, where this was initially published. And after Annie Fields' husband died in 1881, Sarah and Annie kind of moved in together. It was frequently called a Boston marriage and it's very difficult to kind of shove historical figures into modern boxes. They call it like a romantic friendship. Even now with figures in pop culture, if they don't explicitly come out, the press will put out things about how like, oh, I, I saw very frequently, Kristen Stewart is with her gal pal. That, that's kind of the euphemism now, is gal pal. At the time, it was Boston marriage. And that was kind of wrapped up in this idea of these early feminist women who just didn't really want a man. And it's not necessarily a, you know... NC-17 warning smooching situation between the two of them. They just kind of have a symbiotic relationship. But it was a thing at the time to burn any personal correspondence, things like love letters. What journals and letters of Sarah's did survive, she has occasionally expressed feelings of romantic love toward women. So, you know, it's not too far of a leap to make there, but... So I, I really like this particular story, not just in terms of Sarah Orne Jewett and her life and how I get to talk about that, but also it kind of serves in some ways to normalize that kind of relationship without, you know, the romantic entanglement. Because you have the older lady who's doing just fine on her own, and then she has her niece. And it says at the end, perhaps, I, I do like that ending where it's like, so you want to know what happened to them? Let's, ju let's just make believe. Let's just pretend we know exactly what happened because we, we like a tidy conclusion. Who doesn't like the idea that they now become close companions forever? It's, it's so nice. It's such a nice story. For everyone except Melissa, who was adopted as an orphan and has lived a life of servitude, from which she will never escape, even in the rosy conclusion. 
the intersection of feminism and classism at this point was not yet a thing, apparently. So I hope you enjoyed A Lost Lover by Sarah Orrin Jewett. And if you did, make sure to go like it down below so that I know that you, you know, liked it so that maybe we'll do more like this in the future. And while you're down there, make sure that you subscribe and hit the bell so that you get notified next week when we read another piece of classic literature together. I'll see you then.